day to be at church. Welcome to City First. We're so glad you're with us. Come on, we're gonna sing together today. Here we go, yeah. For every battle you've won without question, for every lie that you silence with love, we acknowledge you in every victory, Almighty God. Hey. For every promise you kept in the valley, for every burden you've lifted with ease, we have gathered with great expectation. Lord, we believe. Yes, we do. Yeah. You never cease to amaze us. All of the praises, Lord, they belong to you. Jesus, receive all the glory. Take all the credit for what you're about to do. Every good thing, every good thing comes from you. Showed us your sovereign for every trial that taught us to trust. We are standing right here in your purpose as you stand with us. Oh, yeah. You never cease to amaze us. All of the praises, Lord, they belong to you. Jesus, receive all the glory, take all the credit. You're about to do yeah. Every good thing Every good thing Comes from you Every good thing Every good thing Comes from you Thank you Lord For every good thing joining us, us online. We are so glad you are here. I want to take just a second and greet some pretty special people. You know, every time that we gather together, we know that there are people who brave walking in this really big building for the very first time and that never gets old to us. You brave watching us online for the first time. And to those individuals who want to say you are our honored guests, we are so glad that you are here. And if you're in the room, we have something special for you. After service is dismissed, be sure to swing by one of our Next Step booths out in the lobby. Uh, we would love to put a gift in your hand. It's just our way of saying thank you so much for coming and being here with us today. And if you're joining us online for the first time, drop that in the chat. We would love to greet you. So church, let's give our guests, you know the drill. Let's give our guests a huge warm City First Church welcome. We're gonna continue in our service today by going into a time of worship and we're gonna sing a song about how good our God is. I wanna read you a scripture, it's Psalm 107, 
one through three, it says this, oh, thank God, he is so good. His love never runs out. How many of you are grateful for God's love that never runs out? All of you set free by God, tell the world. Tell how he freed you from oppression, then rounded you up from all over the place, from the four winds, from the seven seas. Thank God, he is good. So let's sing this song together. God has been so good. Let's proclaim it out loud today, church. Oh, we thank you for your goodness, God. We praise you, Jesus. You sing. I call you faithful for the promises you've kept and every need you've met. Lord, I'm so.
starts to break declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus all that freedom reign today today shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness over every enemy Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus
Father, we make that more than a song today, but we make it our prayer and our life's declaration that we would burn with passion, God, to live your way. And God, we do know that there's power in your name, there's healing in your name, there's freedom in your name. And so God, we speak your name each and every day, and Lord, we follow you. We love you in this place. And everybody said, amen. Let's give God praise. Let's thank him for who he is. Serve a good, faithful God. Amen. It's going to be a great day together. We're so glad you're with us at church. You can go ahead and have a seat. As you do that, tell the person next to you, it's great to see you today. Well, each and every time that we gather, we always take a moment to receive a free will offering. And if you would like to participate today, there'll be some ways that you could give digitally uh, on the screen, or if you're in the room and you have a physical gift on your way out, uh, you could drop it in the box near the exit. Well, as you prepare your gifts, I wanna share with you uh, some teaching about finances. You know, uh, one of Jesus's greatest messages that he ever preached is called the Sermon on the Mount. And you can find this in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And throughout this entire sermon, it's one of Jesus's most famous sermons. And what he does is he compares and contrasts many things as he's discussing, as he's sharing this, this teaching with the people that are listening. He compares earth and heaven, and he can contrast darkness and light. He talks about how we can't serve two masters. We either have to serve God or serve the enemy, Satan. And one of the most famous verses that he shares, and it's been one of my personal favorites uh, in this season, is Matthew 6, 33. And it says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you or provided for you. So what Jesus is actually saying here is that there is an order to the way that we should live our lives and that we should seek to live in a way that Jesus has described and what he teaches. And that when we do that, then he ensures that we will have everything that we need. And what's great here is this principle applies to every area of our life, that when we seek his, fi his uh, priorities first, his way of living in our relationships, in our preferences, in our desires, in our family, and in our relationships, and in our finances, then he'll provide everything we need. See, God is trusting each one of us with the money or the resource or the finance that we have, which means it's our job to prioritize Jesus first in our finances. See, you can clap for that, that's good. That's a good thing to clap for. You know, oftentimes what happens, and we shouldn't do this, but we prioritize things like our mortgage company first, our utility company first, or if I could step on some toes, some Starbucks first, or our auto lender first. But what we need to do is we need to prioritize Jesus in his way first. In all of our finances that we have, all of our resources, it's really important that we understand this. They're given to us by God. They're his funds. And what we have to do is we have to honor God with our finances. We're to be obedient with our tithes and generous with our offerings. And when it comes to our finances, we must apply the principle that Matthew 6, talks about, to live God's way first, and then he will provide everything that we need. And the good news is this isn't just a principle, but this is actually a promise, which brings a lot of power with it. So when we prioritize God in our finances, he makes sure that we are never in need. So let me go ahead and pray for our gifts this morning. God, I thank you for each person that's here today and those that are giving and God, we thank you that you entrust us with resource. And God, we ask that you would help each one of us to seek you first in our area of finances, to trust you with our finances and be obedient to the ways that you desire us to live. And we thank you that when we do that, God, that you provide everything that we need and you take care of us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, as we conclude our relationship series here, uh, we're gonna hear a message from Pastor Jeremy. And what we wanna do is we wanna take a moment and give all of the parents a heads up to the content of this message. Uh, so the content of this message is not intended for the ears of small children. So we would ask that if you do have a child in the room today, we wanna encourage you to take advantage of our amazing 
kids ministry during the rest of uh, this morning's message. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and check out what's happening at City First. City First Church is one church with multiple locations. Welcome everyone watching online, City First Anywhere, all the guys that got behind bars, and everyone in a seat at our Spring Creek and Cape Coral locations. Now, let's check out what's coming up. City First Leadership College invites you to celebrate all that God has done in and through these amazing students this school year. The CFLC graduation ceremony is tonight at 6 p.m. in the City First Chapel. Congratulations, class of 2024. Second Saturday serve is May 11th. Every second Saturday of the month, we partner with our local organizations to bring tangible help and hope in Jesus' name. Visit cityfirst.church forward slash serve day to sign up. Mother's Day is May 12th. This special Sunday will be a celebration for all the mamas in our lives. Make sure to bring the whole family for photo ops and a special gift for every mom. Child dedication is also happening on May 12th. If you'd like to be a part of this special Sunday, visit cityfirst.church church forward slash child dedication for more information and to sign up. Our next food distribution is Tuesday, May 14th at 10 a.m. If you or someone you know is in need of food, drive through our Spring Creek location to receive fresh groceries. Christian Life Schools is hosting their next open house on Saturday, May 18th. Discover the difference of a Christ-centered education, RSVP at clsschools.org. For more information on next steps and events, download the City First app and follow us on social media. Finally, due to the broadcasting of this message, if you have a small child in service, please utilize the family room or the mother's room to enjoy service with your child. Thank you so much for joining us today. And now we are wrapping up our series, In My Relationship Era, with a message from Pastor Jeremy Dewart. All right, put your hands together if you're excited to be in church. I'm excited you're in church. I want to say again, if you're visiting with us, if you're a guest, I want to say Jen and I are so happy that you're here, and let's welcome all locations. Let's welcome Cape Coral, Janesville, Wisconsin, also God Behind Bars, Dixon and Hardy, everyone on the Pando app, and everyone at City First Anywhere. We love you guys very, very much. So we are closing out our In My Relationship Era series, and we've actually had a lot of really positive feedback about this, and so we've even extended it one week till today, and we are talking about how to have healthy, life-giving relationships. So today, I'd like to talk about a somewhat touchy, difficult subject nowadays because there are so many conflicting opinions in our culture about this subject, and I've entitled my message, counterfeit love, counterfeit love. And what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about our overly sexualized society. That's what we're going to talk about today. Some of you are like, oh, we're going to have church. All right, here we go. All right. Now, I realize that uh, this may be a little bit of an uncomfortable subject for some people, but I'm going to try to do this in a very careful and level-headed way. Uh, but many times, when we think about sex, we don't want to talk about sex within the church because when we do, we think this is what comes to mind, right? Jesus is watching you. Now, I will tell you this. If you were driving through Wisconsin, there'd be a third sign that says cheese right underneath that, all right? <laughs> but we really do live in an over-sexualized society Unless we think this is just a young person topic. You know, some might be going, oh, this is for all those youngins. No, that's not true. In fact, a recent study, I'm going to show you the stats here when it comes to age and exposure to pornography. If you notice that 18 to 29-year-olds have the same percentage of watching pornography in the last month as 50 to 64-year-olds, and also your 30 to 49-year-olds are the ones that have watched it most. So here's the thing, this is not just a young adult kind of sermon, this is for everyone. In fact, the average age of first exposure to pornography is 12 years old in America. It's 12 years old. Now this is just one example of the over-sexualization. 
I'm not talking about pornography today. That is not the subject. But I'm just using this as an example of it is everywhere, and every age bracket, every demographic is engaging in some form or fashion of sexuality, and we need to talk about it as a church. And here's the reason why. Many times people think that this topic needs to be kicked out of the church. In other words, don't talk about sex in the church because it is taboo. But if we do that, then the unintended consequence is we've now relegated education about sex to our school system, to our media, to Hollywood, to music, to culture. And listen, we're all learning about sex every single day in our culture. The question is, who's teaching it? Right? So today, I want to talk about it as your pastor, and I realize it's going to be a little bit intense today, and that's okay. We can all handle that. And if it is your first time here, we don't talk about this every week, all right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I start with this premise. The premise is, if we are created beings, and I realize some people might be guests or peeking in the window online or whatever, and you're not real sure if creation really did happen. Maybe you're more of an evolutionary, evolutionist kind of a mindset, or you believe in that. Um, but you know what? We here at City First, we believe that the Bible says that we are created beings, that, that we're created on purpose and for a purpose, which means that there's a creator. And if we are created beings and if there's a creator, then I think we need to ask the question, what does the creator say about us and sex. You know, culture has a lot to say about sex. In fact, if you go back and do the studies in the late 1950s, early 1960s, a revolution took place called the sexual revolution. Some of you were alive back then. So it was a little bit before my time, but I've studied up on it, and I realized that through the 60s, there was a lot of angst in especially American culture regarding sex and, 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 and free expression and all of these things. And really, it, it was this thing where sex came out of the bedroom and it came into the mainstream. There were even protests that took place at like, you know, University of California, Berkeley, where there are demonstrations against Puritanism. In other words, we're no longer gonna embrace like that rigid kind of view of sex, but rather instead, we're gonna embrace free love and expression, and this would become the new norm. And pretty soon, sex came out of the bedroom, and sex began to be talked about, shown a lot in our culture. Um, it began to sell things. Sex sold cars, furniture, soap, whatever, you know? Um, sex was in mu movie, movies, excuse me, music, um, media, uh, different things. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that sex didn't influence those mediums before the sexual revolution. They did. But really, after the sexual revolution, sex just kind of was everywhere. You could almost say that the floodgates were opened. And here we are today, decades later, and here we are in our society, and we're still talking about it. I mean, Every day, probably on your favorite news website, or if you go to various blogs, or if you watch TV or movie or streams or whatever else, you're gonna see sex somewhere. It's gonna be talked about, it's gonna be described, it's gonna be explained, it's gonna be shown, right? It's gonna be everywhere. So here is my question. Are we better because of this sexual revolution? In today's society, are we better than what we were in maybe 1950, 1940, whatever else. I mean, and I know there's people arguing both sides of that issue. Shirley MacLaine said many, many years ago, and she was actually right on this, sex is hardly ever just about sex. It's really true. Sex nowadays is not just an act. It is an identity. It sells. Um, there's all kinds of things. In fact, if you look in our society, everything's dripping in sex. But here's another question. Is sex the same as love? Sometimes it feels like, at least to me, my opinion, is that people in a desperate pursuit of love settle for sex. You know, sex was invented by God. It's actually a gift from God. Sex is not a sin. Now, it can be a sin, but it's not a sin. The Bible says that actually it was a gift. It was given to us, you could say, in the way that God created us. 
The Bible also does talk about sexual sin. He said, basically, the Bible says that sexual sin is more impacting to us as individuals than any other sin. Now, in God's eyes, all sin is the same. In other words, he's perfect, God's perfect, we're not. We lie, we steal, whatever it is, it's all equal in his eyes. It's all sin. But he makes a distinction. The Bible makes a distinction. God, through the word of God, says that sexual sin will actually make you carry more baggage. It actually damages you in a different way. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, there is a sense in which sexual sins are different from all others. In sexual sin, we violate the sacredness of our own bodies. You know your body is sacred. It is a sacred gift from God. He created you, okay? These bodies that were made for God-given and God-modeled love for becoming one with another. Sexual sin, in other words, can give you more baggage, more damage, can hurt your heart, hurt your soul more than just any other sin. And, and I would say if I could kind of encapsulate a statement that our culture and our society is saying about sex, it is this. In your personal pursuit of sex and love, there are no rules if it feels right. When I originally wrote this, I wrote this saying, and it doesn't hurt someone else. I actually added that to that statement. And as I showed my notes to Jen, she goes, I don't know if that's true in all areas of, of, of society anymore. Instead, some people believe you can do whatever you want if it feels right, even if it does hurt somebody else. So in other words, go with your desires. Do whatever you want. Yet I would argue this. I would argue that every desire, not just sexual desire, every desire has to have a boundary. Because if you don't have boundaries, what was originally a gift can become damaged, jaded, and twisted. It can become something that was not originally intended to be. So desires must be kept in check by morals. And I love what uh, C.S. Lewis, a theologian in the last century said. He said this about morals. He says, when you remove morals from the human equation, you remove humanity from the human equation. Boundaries are not bad. Boundaries are actually good, all right? You know, if we have a God who loves us, a God who created us, and just like the Bible says that, that he, he focuses in on us, all his attention is on us, then wouldn't we wanna look to him and say, God, how should we live? And wouldn't we also assume that he would want us to have a fulfilling life? Like, as an earthly father, I have three boys. Um, I'm very flawed as an earthly father. And, and you know what? I want all three of my boys, I want them to have a great life. I'm gonna do everything in my power to give them a setup for a great life. So if I'm a human father that's very flawed, how much does the heavenly father, who is not flawed, want us to have a life to the fullest, a life that is abundant, like Jesus said in John 10.10? 10. So he wants us to have a good life. He wants us to find real love, real joy, real purpose. So maybe then we could also assume that God is not a cosmic killjoy when it comes to our sex. He's not trying to be prudish and say, you only do these things because I want you to suffer. That's not it at all. But rather instead, he's trying to show us the way we are to live. So to know how we are to live, we gotta go back to the fact that we were created and the creation story is found in Genesis chapter one. It says this in Genesis 1, then God said, let the earth produce every sort of animal, each producing offspring of the same kind, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and wild animals. And that is what happened. God made all sorts of wild animals, livestock, and small animals, and each able to produce offspring of the same kind. And God saw that it was good. All right, it was good. Like He was like, I created this, it is good. Now, in England, if I were here and you were the crowd in the UK or whatever, I would say this, full stop. 
In other words, there's a pause here, there's a period, there's a full stop, and there is a second thought. And God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. This reflects the Trinity, three in one, all right? So God, you know, God the Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, okay? They basically say, let's make, let's make humans in our own image here, all right? They will reign over the fish and sea, so they're at a different level. Us humans, we're at a different level, okay? The birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, here's something that's really clear. There's a clear line of demarcation in the creation story between animals and us. Now, I realize some of us, we have dogs and cats that we consider to be our family members. They aren't, all right? They're animals, okay? Now, you can go ahead and feel free to continue to believe that they're, you know, your, your brother or sister or cousin or whatever. Okay, that's cool. But my point is, in reality, we're different than the animals. We function different. We live different. We have purpose that is different, all right? And you and I, when it comes to our sexuality and our sex, we are not animalistic in how we live. There is a certain way that we live and we're made in the image of God. What's the number one characteristic of God? Okay, on the count of three, most of you will know this, right? One, two, three. Therefore, if love is the number one characteristic of God in the way that we function as human beings, but also, especially in sex, love must be the dominant characteristic. You and I live different than animals. Animals can't fall in love. We can. You see, we are the only creation that was made in the image of the creator. There's nothing else. When he made the mountains, when he made, you know, the, you know, the cows, when he made, you know, the horses, we made whatever. When he made everything, he didn't make those in his image. He only made you and I in his image. And it says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. And every woman said, amen. amen. All right. I will make him a helper who is just right for him. Now that word helper, a lot of times that's misinterpreted. Many people think that that means that the woman was created only to come and help the man. They actually go back into the original language. It means that it is the co-partner in life. It means to be at the side of, not to be under, all right? That's very important that you understand that. So God created a woman to just be right. It's like, it's like the perfect other half. Does that make sense? The Hebrew word for male is ish. The Hebrew word for female is ah. When Adam saw Eve, he went ah. When Eve saw Adam, she went ish. <laughs> and thousands of years later, nothing has changed. <laughs> you see, it's important to see this. Sex entered the world before sin did. It's very important to see this. Sex is not bad. It is not sinful in itself. It is not part of the fall of man and woman. But the enemy has jaded it, and the enemy has no creative power. All he can do is distort and corrupt what is already created. You hear that? He, he hasn't created a thing in his entire life other than a rebellion. He's not created anything. All he can do is take what God created and jade it and turn it and pollute it. That's all he can do. Therefore, he's taken something in the gift of sex that God gave us, and he has distorted it in our culture. And he's convinced our culture that you can separate sex from your soul. This is very important. People think, oh, I can have sex, and it's not gonna damage my heart. That's not the way that you were created. You are all one. You know, we look now and it's like culture basically looks at sex as not being a gift from God, but something that we just do. 
in a sense. And in other words, it, we need to realize it is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. Culture also has, has basically given us this lie that um, the church, that we shouldn't talk about sex. So here's a question that, um, that many of us might be wondering, or at least I know culture has said, and sometimes even people have said to me as a pastor, is they said this, why is my sex life the church's business? You know, and that's a good question, I guess. I mean, first of all, it's not the church's business, okay? We're not in the business of sex, okay? All right, that's not it, okay? No matter what they say out there, okay? That's not it. Very simply, the reason why we can talk about it in the church is this is because God created you, and sex is something you are before it is something you do. You are a sexual being. You were created to be sexual. Um, the creator wanted you, in a sense, to be created the way that you were created. Otherwise, we couldn't procreate. Like, we couldn't, we couldn't multiply as a, and I hate using this word because it sounds like Darwin, but as a species. We could not do that, right? Genesis basically said that the man and the woman were naked and felt no shame. They had complete intimacy with no shame before sin entered the world. But then sin entered the world and they discovered their nakedness and shame came upon them. God designed us to be fully known with our spouse, to be intimate. The entire person, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually, to become one. In other words, you cannot park your soul outside of the bedroom. Great sex actually is based on a lot of non-sexual things. Great sex is based on things like trust and Commitment, obviously love, communication, emotional intimacy. There's a lot of things that are more than just the act. That's why sex is rarely ever just about sex. There's a lot more coming together, soul to soul, heart to heart, person to person. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is writing this church that's in a city called Thessalonica. It's now called, today in modern day, it's called Thessaloniki. It's in the northern part of Greece. And this, um, this city was actually very confused sexually. They, like many Roman and Greek cities, did whatever they wanted when it came to sex. And we, many times in America now, in 2024, we look at America and we're like, oh my gosh, we're so terrible with our lack of values when it comes to sex. And, and there is some truth to that, but I'm gonna tell you, we don't even hold a candle to Thessalonica. Thessalonica was a lot worse than us. In fact, Paul was writing this group of believers and he's saying that it's gonna be very difficult to live pure in that society because in Paul's day, um, they had a big temple in the middle of town. It was a pagan temple. It was not a Christian temple. Um, it was to a pagan god. And like what you would do, and this was the same in Corinth, like the Corinthians and places like that, is that people would come in, citizens would come into the temple, and they would basically pick out a prostitute, male or female. They would do perverse sexual things as worship to the pagan god. This was very common. This was like going to church every Sunday. And, and not only that, but even Roman men back in the first century church, they would many times have upwards of, let's say, three ladies in their life. They would have um, the, the lady that bore his children. Um, he would have the woman who was his intellectual partner. And then lastly, a woman or multiple women that we would say nowadays were trafficked but they were basically a sex slave or a prostitute. Again, this was very common in Roman day, very common with Roman men. And Paul is trying to cut through all of the confusion, and he's trying to give some instruction. This is what he says in 1 Thessalonians. He says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. Now, sanctified is a churchy term, all right? I'll explain it in a moment. 
that you should avoid sexual immorality, remember the word immorality, that each of you should learn to control his own body, learn. That word is very important, learn. In other words, it's something that's not intuitive. Sometimes it's even something that's hard, okay? But you can learn to do it, to control your own body in a way that is holy and honorable, not in a passionate lust like the heathen, and who, who do not know God, and that in this matter, no one should wrong his brother or take advantage of him. The Lord will punish men for all such sins as we have already told you and warned you, it goes on to say. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, he who rejects this instruction does not reject man, but God who gives you this Holy Spirit. You can control yourself and learn how to avoid sexual sin. You can do it. I can do it. It's possible. Otherwise, God's a hypocrite. If he's asking us to do something that's impossible, then that is unfair. God is saying you can learn to do it. You can learn to live in a society, in a culture, and be sexually pure in the middle of sexual immorality. Now, that word immorality, the Greek there is pornea. This is where we get the word pornography from. The word sanctified, or otherwise sanctification, means this. It means to be set apart for a holy use. In other words, I'm not living this way. I'm set apart from what is going on around me. Sanctification means set apart for a holy use to make pure. So here's the truth. I am personally responsible to pursue sanctification or being set apart. That's my job to do as a Christ follower. I can't ask God to do it for me. I can't ask you to do it for me. I have to live set apart. Therefore, the way I act, the way I talk, the things I see, how I conduct myself is very important. Now, we're gonna come up for air here in a moment. I realize this is a little intense. Take a breath, okay? <laughs> um, it is hard difficult, sometimes almost feels impossible to live in this culture and be pure. Can I just say this as your pastor? Can I just say, I, I, this is not easy. What I'm talking about today is not simple, otherwise everybody would do it. It is very difficult to do, but difficulty should never dictate decisions. In other words, because it's difficult, doesn't mean that I just don't do it. This culture says do what you want. But the Bible basically says this, living right is rarely convenient, but guess what? It pays off and God blesses you for it. Your life will be blessed if you live right. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says this, run away from sexual sin. No other sin is so clearly affects the body as this one does. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. In the King James Version, it says this, flee from immorality. Flee. Now, I want you to look. If you look into the, the, the word, actually what it means in the Greek, it means to run in terror. Literally. I want you to think of like a horror movie and someone's chasing you with a chainsaw. You're like, ah, right? I mean, that's running in terror. Flee from immorality. Run from it. Don't dabble in it. Don't think you're strong enough. Don't think, oh, I can handle it. Oh, I can just look at this website just one time. No, no, don't. Flee from it. Because here's the thing. We have to realize that in this topic of sexuality, but also I would say in our life in general, that our life is gonna be different than cultures and we just gotta embrace it. We gotta be okay with it. You're gonna be different. You're gonna live different. And if you're waiting for someone in culture to approve of different, it's not gonna happen. They want you to be the same. 
They want you to be like them. You know, let me talk to the young people for a moment here. You know, it's hard to be able to grow up in a society where everything is on that electronic device, that smartphone, and to live pure. I mean, that's a gateway. And you can literally go anywhere with a swipe. It's difficult to live in high school and college and in your 20s in a hookup culture where people are doing things and you obviously are trying to figure out your identity, who you are, and in Christ especially, and you're trying to navigate all that. It's difficult when, when all your friends are asking, I wonder if the next season of euphoria is coming out, and you're thinking to yourself, I don't want to watch that. But all your friends do. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about right now that are older. (laughs) But I guarantee you that the young adults in here do. You know, it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. But that doesn't mean that you don't do it. And then if you do it, God will bless you for it. You're going to go into life without all that baggage that many of us older individuals who bought into the lie of culture now carry into our later years. It is because... We bought into that. You won't do that. You won't have that baggage. Your relationships, whether you're single or married or dating or whatever, they're going to be pure. They're going to be life-giving. They're going to be Jesus-centered. They're going to be blessed. It is so worth it. And then for all the rest of us that are old, (laughs) we're not exempt from this talk. I was talking to a semi-retired couple within the last six months and they were just heartbroken. They're like, so many of our friends are like getting into this swinger lifestyle. I'm like, what? This is like a Seinfeld episode. What? I mean, you kidding me? (laughs) Trust me, this is not just a young adult thing. You saw the stats. We're gonna have to live different too. We're gonna have to live committed to our spouse that we said till death do us part. That we will will not laugh at the same jokes on the work site. That we're not going to engage in the same media as everybody else. Just because it's on Netflix and it's the hottest thing trending doesn't mean we have to watch it. See, see, here's the thing. It's gonna be different for us and, and we can do it and it's gonna be difficult. But it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, I love what Peter says. He says, beloved, I implore. <laughs> I mean, that's a strong word there. It's like I beg. I implore you as aliens and strangers and exiles. He's basically saying, we are not of this world. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. In other words, we don't model the same value systems, the same priorities, or the same actions. We're different in our methodologies. We're different in our motivations. We're different in our fruit. Everything is different about us. We're aliens, we're strangers, we're exiles in this world. What? To abstain from the central urges, the evil desires, the passions of the flesh, your lower nature that wage war against the soul. And really what we're, I'm not trying to over-sensationalize this. I'm just basically jumping off of what Peter said here. What we're really talking about is a war for your soul. That's what we're really talking about here. There's an enemy and there's a God. And both want you to give him your soul. So which one are you going to (laughs) do? You see, if you reserve sex for your spouse, your husband or wife, within the context of the covenant of marriage, guess what? It is gonna pay off in multiple ways. It is gonna pay off in multiple ways. I know some people think, well, you gotta kick the tires before you buy the car. Doesn't work that way. Here's some benefits. A benefit of doing it God's way is you're gonna sense God more. You sit there, and what do you mean by that? Well, Matthew 5, 8 says this, God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. There's a direct correlation between having a pure heart and seeing and sensing God. The purer your heart, the more you can see God. Second benefit is this, you'll avoid a lot of guilt and shame. 
You won't have to carry the baggage forward that many of your peers will carry. Number three, you're gonna avoid unintended, con unintended consequences because uh, sometimes if you live a life of open sex, there are unintended consequences. You won't have to deal with those things. Number four, you will love God more. You say, what do you mean? Well, God loves you to the fullest extent that he could love you, but the way we live determines how much we love God. So therefore, if we're living in such a way that makes us kind of feel ashamed in God's presence, that's gonna impact our relationship with God. So if you live pure and holy to the best of your ability, to the best, not perfect, but to the best of your ability, you and God are gonna have an intimate, tight relationship. So as we close, what do you do if you already bought into culture's lie about sex? What do you do if you've already crossed many lines, made many decisions? You might be listening to this going, I wish I would have heard this two years ago, 20 years ago. What do you do? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what I did, what I experienced from God. Because before I was a pastor, before I was a Christian, or a Christ follower, I bought in to the enemy and culture's lie of hookup culture, partying, one night stands, the whole nine. I lived that life. I lived it at the latter part of my high school years, throughout my college years, my young adult years. And so by the time I came to a church like this, actually it was this church, and I gave my life to Jesus, I had baggage. And I had to go on a journey of restoration and getting things redeemed and getting things fixed that were broken inside of me, even the way my mindset was, how I saw the world, how I saw other people, I had to go on a journey. But this is the thing, I'm standing for you today years later, and I am married to the most beautiful woman on the planet. We will be celebrating our 29th anniversary this July. I have three great kids, an amazing daughter-in-law, and you know what? God has restored what was damaged. Regardless of your status, you might be single, you might be married, you might have been married and now you're divorced. Maybe you're divorced and remarried. Maybe you're widowed. Wherever you're at right now, whatever age, and if you've bought into the lie of this culture, I have a strong message from God for you today. And it is this, you can be whole again. You can be whole again. And it's because of this promise is this found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. God, your God, will restore everything you lost. This is a promise for you. It's a promise for you right now watching in your living room. He'll have compassion on you. He's not gonna point a finger at you and be like, ah, oh, you screwed up, you suck, okay? No. He'll come back and pick up the pieces from all the places where you were scattered, your heart scattered. He'll give you a good life. He'll make you more numerous than your ancestors. In other words, your future is brighter than your past. Goes on and say this, God, your God will cut away the thick calluses on your heart and your children's hearts even, freeing you to love God, your God, with your whole heart and soul and live, I mean really live. Don't just live, really live. And you will make a new start. In other words, he's gonna give you a new beginning. Listen obediently to God, keeping all his commandments that I'm commanding you today. You can have a new start, a new beginning. I mean, I said this in the first service and I'm gonna say it again. It's, it's borderline, it has a tinge of cheesiness and it wasn't in my notes. I actually erased it because I was like, oh, that's kind of cheesy. But I really believe it. 
I believe that spiritually speaking, on the inside in our souls, that you can become a virgin again. That God can restore you. That yes, you did what you did. You've experienced what you've experienced. You've chose what you chose. But God can give you a brand new beginning. A brand new start. You don't have to live with the baggage or the shame or the habits. He can help you. So we're going to close our, head, close our eyes and bow our heads. And I, um, I'm not going to have you raise your hand or anything. <laughs> I just want to pray for you, and then we'll close. Heavenly Father, I pray for my friends. Lord, I realize many of them like me, made wrong decisions in the past, living with some baggage, some consequence. But God, I pray that God, you would restore what the enemy has stolen, ruined, polluted. God, I pray that we would live different in our culture. That when people see us as Christ followers, they wouldn't just see us doing everything that everyone else is doing, watching what everybody else is watching, participating in what everybody else is participating in. But God, instead, that we would be sanctified, we would be set apart for a holy purpose. God, I know it's difficult to do, but you'll give us the strength to do it. Lord, we won't be perfect. There's gonna be times that we mess up. But overall, Lord, you will make us victorious. You will give us strength. Lord, I do pray for people that have maybe had wounds from the past. I pray heal their heart because whatever sex, whatever activity, whatever stuff that they've encountered has left a wound, I pray God heal them. Heal them and restore them. Let them know that today they have hope and a new beginning. We love you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Come on, give God a huge round of applause. Can you do that? Wow, what an incredible message by Pastor Jeremy Dewart. Um, maybe right now in this moment, you're thinking it's time for a new beginning or even possibly a fresh start. If you're thinking about that, I would love to invite you and to encourage you to take this moment and to consider giving your life to God. Here at City First Church, we believe that when we give our life to God, it invites him in to be the leader and savior and the controller of our life, helping us not only have access to heaven, but also access to being a part of his great and grand mission. If you would like to make that decision, I would like that you to close your eyes and bow your head and repeat this after me. Dear Lord, I know that I've made mistakes and I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. I now invite you to be the leader and forgiver of my life. And in Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Wow, congratulations on making the greatest decision that you can make. Real fast, there's two things you need to know. First of all, you got to share this with someone. Tell someone you love, someone you know that you just made this important decision. And secondly, that we want to come beside you and resource you. If you scan the QR code that's on the screen right now, we would love to get a new beginnings resource in your hand. With that being said, I would like to invite Jenny to come back up here with us. Hey guys, after you guys go through the new beginning resource that Cameron's talking about, which just gives you the what's next in your walk of faith, we invite you to go through Girl Growth Track and Growth Track is a great way to get connected here at City First, but also to discover your God given talents and purpose and the life that He has created you to live. It starts the first Sunday of every month online and in person, and we'd love for you to join. That's right. Everything that you see here at City First Church is due to the obedience and the giving of some really incredible and generous people here. In fact, we have a program called Generosity Rockstar for individuals who feel like they have the gift of giving. If you would like to be a part of that, it is just a reoccurring gift of $20 a week. We would love for you to join our team. Go ahead and uh, scan the QR code that's on the screen right now or visit the website or the app. Awesome. And we are so glad that you joined us today. The best thing you can do, come back next week. That's we are going right. to have an amazing time celebrating all of our moms. Mm -hmm. It's going to be awesome. We love you so much. We're praying for you. If you need prayer for anything, drop it in the app, drop it in the chat. But we love you, and we'll see you right back here next week.